Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. So Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, and the word of the sovereign Lord reads, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Everett Harrison, in his commentary, once noted that no sinner, whether a mystic aspiring to direct contact with God or a legalist counting on good works for approval in God's sight is able in those ways to find acceptance with God. Jesus must be the medium of the return of the sinner to a righteous God. So I want to welcome you back to our sermon series on the book of Romans titled The Power of the Gospel. And as you know that we are in this series walking through this letter because it is the clearest, most complete explanation of the gospel in the entire Bible. The letter to the Romans is not only Paul's theological masterpiece, it is a book, um, it is the book in our Bible that helps believers to truly grasp and understand what the gospel is, how the gospel works, and then how we are to live in light of the truth of the gospel. And as you can tell, we have been going through this letter rather slow. In fact, this is the 34th part of Romans, uh, and we are just now coming to the end of chapter 5. I promise I won't be as slow as John Piper. But the reason why we're moving slow and deliberately is because there's just really, as you have seen, so much to talk about. Uh, and uh, especially beginning in, you know, with Paul's declaration in chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel, as Paul says, is the power of God to save any person, anywhere, Jew or Gentile. It's the power of God to bring life to the dead, which means this is the message that our world so desperately needs. This is the message that's needed in the United States. This is the the message that's needed in Slovakia. This is the, the message that's needed in Pakistan. This is the message that's needed all over the world. And then after this declaration, Paul sets out to explain in detail what the gospel is. And in beginning in verse 18 through the middle of chapter 3, Paul explains the gospel uh, by starting off explaining the bad news that all of mankind is by nature sinful and under the wrath of God. Paul doesn't begin with the good news. He actually starts with the bad news that makes the good news necessary. And that's the truth that all of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, are sinners under God's wrath. It doesn't matter if you're religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter how you were raised. It doesn't matter how hard you work or don't work to try to obey a bunch of rules. All of mankind is helplessly covered in sin and under the judgment and the wrath of God. That is the bad news. But then the good news, Paul, he explains in the beginning in the middle of chapter 3 all the way to the end of chapter 4, is the truth that God has made a way for mankind to be reconciled to himself through the work and the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul says in chapter 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. That is the good news, that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Well, then after explaining what the gospel is, Paul in chapter 5 begins to unpack for us the blessings of the gospel, the blessings that believers receive because of their faith in Christ. And I call them the three Ps of the gospel. They are peace, presence, and provision. We're told in Romans chapter 5 that those who are justified by faith have 
peace in that moment, present tense, peace with God, where we were once the enemies of God, where we were once completely at odds with God, we are now completely at peace and in harmony with Him. And not only that, those who are in Christ dwell in the presence of God and have direct access to Him. One of the greatest blessings that any Christian or any person in the world can have is the fact that when you, when you stand in the presence of God, you speak His name, He hears you, He listens to you, He is with you everywhere you go. And then you also have access to His whole sphere of His grace. And if that were not enough, then you have the blessings of God's provision, that God provides everything we need, including His Holy Spirit pouring out His love into our hearts continually. Not only that, we then have the provision of a future that can't be taken away from us, the hope of heaven. And then we have the, the, the truth and the assurance of God's love because it's been demonstrated in history through the death of Christ. And then we have the provision of being drawn into God's family. We have been reconciled back to God. Again, peace, presence, and provision. And then after after that, he explains what, after he explains what the blessings of the gospel is, Paul begins to unpack for us how it is the gospel actually works. I mean, we know what the gospel is, but actually, how does it work? How is it that all men are born sinners? How is it that all men universally are sinful in nature and will? How is it that all mankind universally is under the judgment and the wrath of God? But even more importantly, how is it that mankind can be made right with God? And especially not by our own merits or our work, but by faith in Christ. How is that even possible? How can one man's sin enslave the world? And even more importantly, how can one man's life and sacrifice save it? Well, beginning in verse 12 through the end of chapter 5, Paul explains just that. How it is that mankind is made a sinner and how he is made right with God by faith in Christ. And in today's text, Paul summarizes all of that as he finishes thoughts on how the gospel works and how it applies to mankind. And he, and he does it, and as he does so, he's going to emphasize an important gospel theme. An important gospel theme that quite honestly, oftentimes is overlooked. It's a theme that we tend to miss when we read the scriptures. It's a ten, it, it's, in fact, it's a theme that many people tend to ignore. But it's a theme that Paul has been driving at and driving home deliberately in this text. And it's a theme that he's been building on since the very beginning of this letter. And it's a theme that many Christians don't want to think about. It's a theme that many people just don't take the time to study. It's a theme that, that's missing from so many gospel presentations. And it's a theme that's missing from so many people's theology. And it's the theme of righteousness. It's the truth of righteousness. And the reason why I know that this is something that's missing and that many people ignore is because when you ask most people to explain what the gospel is or even just ask them, what has Christ done for us? Most people will never mention the words righteousness or never even hint at the idea when you ask people, what has Christ done for us? Most people will invariably say, well, Jesus died for our sins, which is absolutely true. Jesus did die for our sins. He did make atonement for our sins by his own blood. Praise the Lord for that. But why? Well, it's because Jesus loves us. Well, I know that he loves us. But why was shedding his blood necessary? Why was dying on the cross necessary? What makes that kind of act of love necessary for us? I mean, there's lots of ways for God to express his love to us, and he does so in many different ways. He even expresses his love to unbelievers by giving them life and relationships and the taste of food and cooler weather, praise the Lord, coming up soon, hopefully, right? right? God gives his, his, his general grace to everyone. So there's lots of ways that God can express his love. Why this act of love? Why did Jesus have to do what he do, what he did? Well, it's because of our need. Because our need is for righteousness. That's what makes it necessary. If we're going to be reconciled back into a relationship with God and have peace with him, we need to have more than simply our sins washed away. 
We need to be more than just absent of sin. We need to be made righteous, positively righteous in the sight of God. And the reason for that, the reason why we need to be righteous is because that is what was required to have fellowship with a holy God. And also because that's how God created us. He created mankind to be righteous. In fact, if you have a moment, just turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. It should be easy to find because it's right in the beginning. You get past that list of uh, table of contents, right? It's Genesis chapter 2. And beginning in, in verse 26, the word reads, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In in his image, God created him. Male and female, he created them. And then in verse 31, it reads, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning. The sixth day, God created mankind in his image for a relationship. And that image that he's talking about is not a physical image. When you look at our bodies, we're not seeing the image of God in that way because God is a spirit. He's not talking about a physical image, but the image of his attributes. God is holy, and so we are to be holy. God is Loving, so we are to be loving. God is just, so we should be just. God is merciful, so we should be just uh, merciful. God is righteous, and so we are to be righteous. And then in Genesis 2, beginning in verse 15, God lays out the standard of this righteousness, and he said, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded him, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God created mankind perfect and righteous and in his image so that he could have fellowship with him. And then he gave him the freedom to walk in that righteousness or not, which, by the way, is expressed very clearly in the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. In fact, I have uh, put in your notes uh, both uh, portions of chapter 4 and chapter 6 so you can follow along here. But in chapter 4 of of the confession, beginning in paragraph 2, it reads, After God had made all other creatures, he created humanity, and he made them male and female with rational and moral souls, thereby making them suited to the life lived unto God for which they were created. We were created to live in relationship and in fellowship with God. It further says that they were made in the image of God, being endowed with knowledge, and then look at this, righteousness and true holiness. Mankind was endowed from the beginning with righteousness. They were righteous in the sight of God because God created mankind that way. Because that's the condition for fellowship with God. God is righteous, and if mankind is to be in fellowship with him, he must be also righteous. And God, and that is how God created him. And then it says they had a law, the law of God written on their hearts, and the power to fulfill it, even so, they could still transgress the law because they had They were left to the liberty of their own will, which is subject to change. And then in paragraph 3 it reads, In addition to the law written on their hearts, they received a command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As long as they obeyed this command, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Mankind was originally righteous, placed in a covenant relationship with God, the covenant of works, and, and, he, and he was righteous and had the power to remain righteous through obedience. And as long as he was righteous, he had fellowship with God. Because that's how God created mankind to be. Mankind was to be righteous. But as we all know, that didn't last very long. As chapter 6 of our confession states, God created humanity upright and perfect. He gave them a righteous law that would, that would have led to life if he had kept it, but threatened death if he broke it. 
And they did not remain for long in this position of honor. Satan used their, the craftiness of the serpent to seduce Eve, who then seduced Adam. Adam acted without any outside compulsion and deliberately transgressed the law of their creation and the command given to them by eating the forbidden fruit. In a paragraph two, it says, by this sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. It further says that we fell in them and through this Death came in upon all, and all became dead in sin, completely defiled in all capabilities and parts of soul and body. They lost righteousness and then lost fellowship with God as a result. Because without righteousness, no one can be near God. No one can be in fellowship with Him. That is the image of the temple. That is the image of the veil between man and God. That is why we need more than just forgiveness of our sins. We need to be made positively righteous. And that is the theme that Paul is driving home in this text today. Our need for righteousness and how God in his grace has given it to us. Praise the Lord. And so turn with me to Romans 5. And in verse 18... It reads, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation over all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Now, as always, the first thing we need to pay attention to then is the conjunctions, right? The word therefore, as Kyle reminded you guys last week, you should ask that question. What is that word therefore, therefore? Well, Paul uses this phrase to let us know that there's a connection between what he's about to say and what he has already said. And in light of that, there's a couple things I want to point out to you um, to keep in mind. First of all, notice that this is a very similar statement to what Paul had made in verse 12. If you remember, Paul began the verse 12 in almost the exact same way. He wrote in verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man... Right, setting up this comparison and contrast. But then if you remember, he digressed for a little while talking about sin and death and other things finishing, uh, rather than finishing out this comparison. Well, in, in verse 18, Paul finally, you know, like a long-winded preacher, comes right back around, and that's not who I am. I just promise that. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as one, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. Paul finally gets, and gets around to completing his thought in verse 12. But the second thing we ought to take notice of is the fact that Paul is actually clearly summarizing in this section the things that he just unpacked in verses 12 through 17. Right? In verses 12 through 17, if you remember, there are two really big theological themes that Paul was conveying to the Roman church, and we spent the last couple of weeks talking about them. Number one, Paul explained how it is that mankind is affected by Adam's sin, how it is that believers can be affected right, by, by Adam's sin, right? but then when they put their faith in Christ, how they can be affected by Christ's atoning work. And what we see is that there is a a direct relationship between Adam and what he did and all of humanity, but then there's also a relationship between Christ and what he did and all of those who put their faith in him. And we put a name, a theological name to this relationship. We called it, if you remember, federal headship or, or covenantal headship. You see, Adam being our forefather or our covenantal representative before God Adam was placed in the covenant of works, and we being in him were also placed in that covenant. And when Adam failed, then we, by default, failed with him. Again, as as verse 12 explains, therefore, just as one sin came into the world because, excuse me, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all had sinned, That's because Adam is our federal or our covenant representative before God. The confession, uh, the the, the London Baptist Confession of Faith in chapter 6 explains this relationship quite well with Adam. By this first, by this sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. We fell in them. Through and through this, death came upon all. All died in sin and completely defiled in all the capabilities and parts of the soul and body. 
by God's appointment in um, paragraph three, by God's appointment, they were the root and representative of the whole human race. Because of this, the guilt of their sin was accounted and their corrupt nature passed on and all of their offspring who descended from them by ordinary procreation. Their descendants are now conceived in sin and by nature children of wrath and servants of sin, partakers of death and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal, unless the Lord Jesus sets them free. Adam is our representative, our covenant head by birth. When he fell, we fell in him. But Jesus is our new covenant representative, our new federal head. And Jesus, our new representative, succeeded where Adam failed and he fulfilled the covenant of works and, and then, by his own blood, inaugurated the covenant of grace which was promised to us in the Old Testament. And when we put our faith in Christ, we then, as we discover, are no longer in Adam. We now are in Christ. We're no longer in Adam under his headship. We are now in Christ under his headship. As the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones notes. He says, look at yourself in Adam. Though you had done nothing, you were declared a sinner. Look at yourself in Christ and see that though you have done nothing, you are declared to be righteous. And so the first idea that, Paul, idea that he summarizes here is this theological theme of federal headship. We see that in verses 18 through 19. Again, therefore... As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, notice the relationship, one person affected everyone, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many were made righteous. We see that clear representation there. And so Paul summarizes the idea of federal headship here, but then he summarizes another major theme, which is the truth that grace is greater that grace is greater than sin and death, which is exactly what we talked the last time we were together. If you remember, Paul wrote, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. One sin consigned the entire earth to death. Sin and death became universal because of one sin. But grace and the free gift of righteousness is greater than all sin. Well, in verse 20 of today's text, Paul says basically the same thing. Now the law came in to increase trespass, but where sin increased, you can finish it with me, right? Grace abounded all the more. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more because grace is greater than our sin. And so Paul in the section before us this morning is summarizing the theme of a federal headship and the truth about grace being infinitely greater than sin. And keeping these two things in mind as we go along will be helpful to understand where Paul is going in the last part of this section. And so let's just take a little closer look at this text. Coming back to verse 18, he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And the key word that I want to focus on this morning is this word righteousness. Again, it's one of those words I think we can often overlook. overlook. And, and the first reason for this is because the reason why I want to look at this is because this is a huge theme in these few verses. If you notice, this is used, this word is used three times in four verses. And if you actually are paying attention, that this word is used 17 times from, Roman, from the beginning of Romans to the end of Romans 5. There's still more to be, to be talked about here, but it's been used 17 times so far. Righteousness is, in fact, a foundational theme in Paul's letter, and it's a foundational theme for the gospel. Secondly, notice the relationship in this verse. Trespass or sin led to condemnation, and then that ultimately leads to death, which is what we've seen in the previous verses. But notice, I want you to pay attention here, that life comes after justification, and justification comes after righteousness. The thing that we need to see is that righteousness comes first. First. 
That might not mean anything to you, but as we go along, you'll begin to understand why it's so important. Righteousness comes first. You must have righteousness, then you have justification, and then you have life. And, and if you think I'm overplaying this, right, then notice what he says in verse 21. Paul writes, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, the truth is righteousness comes before life. And if you are to have life, if you're going to have the eternal life, then you first must have righteousness. And I emphasize this because we live in a culture wanting to present a gospel message that just doesn't make people uncomfortable. We live in a culture where, where we just don't like to challenge people. We live in a culture where we don't want to take a chance of saying something that might hurt their feelings or, or heaven forbid, offend them. And what we end up doing then in the process is we strip the gospel message down into little impotent platitudes. We take this message about needing to be made righteous and we water it down to a man-centered cocktail to make it palatable enough for somebody to take. And what we'll say is things like, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Or, you know, Jesus loves you. Or, did you know that Jesus died for you? And I want you to hear me, please. Right? Those are true statements, and we should tell people those things. Those are true statements that need to be told, but, but there's something missing in that. Yes, God has a wonderful plan for your life. That plan is for you to glorify Him. And guess what? You will glorify Him either through your salvation or through your judgment. God will always, ultimately, be glorified in your life, some way, somehow. So yes, God has a wonderful plan for your life. The question is, will it be wonderful to you? If you're in Christ, yes, praise the Lord. If you're not, no, it won't be. Yes, God, yes, Jesus loves you. Jesus being the creator of all things, loves his creation. Jesus loves the people that he created. Jesus loved us so much that he died for our sins. But please understand, he hates sin. And he will redeem those who put their faith in him. But he will also, if you read the scriptures, he is the one who will judge them and give justice to them who reject him. He is the one who judges them and consigns them to hell. And yes, Jesus died for your sins. That is true. Praise the Lord for that truth. But that truth is going to be meaningless unless we understand He lived for our righteousness. Because you can't have everlasting life and fellowship without God without being justified before God. And you cannot be justified without being righteous. Righteousness comes first. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is the contrast here. As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. And what we see here, by the way, that Paul sets up this contrast that, tr that trespass or sin is the polar opposite of righteousness. Can you, can you see that? Trespass leads to condemnation. Righteousness leads to, to justification and, and life. And what this means for us is that when Adam fell into sin, what was lost then was righteousness. His righteous standing with God. When he transgressed, when he trespassed, he lost righteousness. And this righteousness then becomes what? When it's not righteousness, it's what? It's unrighteousness. And because of that, he lost fellowship with God. And again, the confession says, by this sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. Adam, by his trespass, became the opposite of righteous. He became unrighteous and lost that ability to be in communion and fellowship with God. And, and this is important for us because just as Adam became unrighteous, we, because we are in Adam, are unrighteous which then forces us to confess that our problem isn't that we are imperfect people who make mistakes now and again. That's how the world wants to paint the picture. That's how so many people who, with good intentions, want to present the gospel, that we're just people, we're just good people who make mistakes. 
Our problem isn't that we're good people who occasionally have lapses of judgment or that we have a few indiscretion. Our problem is the fact that we are unrighteous. That is our problem. And that's a huge problem for us because as Paul said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This right here is the heart of the issue. This is the gospel truth that we must not ever be ashamed of. This is the gospel truth that we must embrace and take to heart. This is the gospel truth that we must, that we must confront the world with. If you're not in Christ, then you are in Adam. And because of that, you are by default unrighteous and under the wrath of God. And I don't care about your morality. I don't care about how good of a person you think you are when you compare yourselves to other people. Because we all do that. We are all comparing ourselves to our neighbor, our friends. We look at somebody else and go, I'm not as bad as that. I don't care if you're nicer or more compassionate and more loving than the Christians that you know. I hear that all the time, too, from people who call themselves atheists. Well, I'm, I'm a better person than every Christian I've ever met. You, that might be the truth if you're talking about human morality. If you're not in Christ, you're by default unrighteous, and being unrighteous the weight of God's condemnation and justice and wrath hangs over your head. The opposite of righteous is unrighteous. And then the fourth thing I want to point out is how Paul compares these phrases. Paul said, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. And notice the phrase, one act of righteousness. The point I want, I want to make here is, is, is the truth that we we understand that there are times when we read the scriptures, we have to really pay attention to the details and think through the context. Because we know, right, the one trespass that Paul's referring to when he talks to Adam, we know what that one is. We know clearly from, from Genesis what he's talking about. But, but here Paul says that one act of righteousness with respect to Jesus. And we all know that Paul isn't saying that Jesus in some, at one point in history just made one right decision and that led to justification. We know that that's not the point. That Jesus didn't go and just do one good thing and then suddenly that that's counted as righteousness. What we understand by the scriptures is that this act of righteousness really is an entire lifetime of righteousness and obedience by Jesus Christ on our behalf. That's what he's talking about. In fact, Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, and being found in him... In human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus' act of righteousness is his entire lifetime of obedience and righteousness. Right? Paul even says, you know, further in Hebrews chapter 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in Every respect has been tempted as we are. Sounds like a lifetime. He says, yet without sin. So Paul isn't saying that Jesus passed one test at one point in his life. What Paul means with respect to one act of righteousness, he's referring to a lifetime of righteousness. You see, righteousness before God is an all or nothing proposition. Either you were righteous or you were not Either you're totally or completely and fully righteous or you are then unrighteous because any tiny act of unrighteousness makes one completely unrighteous. And again, this is important because it addresses a very common objection among many who claim to be atheists. Right? They will say, so you mean to tell me I can live a life where I just do all kinds of good things for people and I can be selfless as possible and I can, I can try really hard to do good and give away all my wealth and help everybody at every turn and sacrifice and do and be compassionate, but somehow some God, God's going to send me to hell for the few things that I do wrong. And I will say, yes, absolutely, for two reasons. First reason is God is just that holy. God is just that holy. God is holy and cannot abide with any transgression at all. That means that you can live a perfect life all of your life and break one command of God and you are completely unrighteous. By the way, which is exactly what the Bible tells us. Doesn't it say that? If you break one command, you are guilty of what? Breaking it all. 
That is how God's standard of righteousness is. It's moral perfection, not just good most of the time. It's completely good. The second reason that sin, the second reason why God would send us to, to hell for a tiny transgression is that sin is just that destructive. So the problem is most people have a very high view of themselves and a high view of the good things that they do, but they, they have a low view of what sin actually is. And they think that their goodness somehow can outweigh or cancel out the sin in their lives. But sin is devastatingly corrupting and destructive. As we talked about, one sin led to death and both spread to the entire world. Every death that takes place now, as we talked about, is an echo of that first sin. Sin is insidious. Sin is destructive. Sin destroys families. It destroys communities. It destroys whole nations as we, as we heard this morning. And so, yes, a tiny little sin can send you to hell, but let's be honest with ourselves. None of us even will measure up to that standard. We're far more sinful than we give ourselves credit. But what we see here is Adam's momentary sin led to a lifetime of sin for him and everyone else. And Adam's momentary sin required the lifetime of righteousness from Christ to overcome. But then praise the Lord, Christ's righteousness overcomes it. That's the good news. Which is the fifth thing I want want you to see in this verse. Therefore, as one sin led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Christ's righteousness undoes sin's condemnation and leads to justification and life for those who trust in him. Christ's righteous life leads to justification for those who put their faith in him. Why? Because Christ, as our federal head and our new covenant representative, fulfilled the covenant of works that Adam failed to fulfill. Jesus earned by his obedience what no human has ever been able to earn, a perfect righteous standing before God, a perfect righteousness that's required to be in communion with God. And by faith in Christ, this is how simple the gospel is. By faith in Christ, we are taken out of Adam and placed in Christ. And just as Adam's sin was imputed to us by birth, Christ's righteous standing before God is imputed to us by faith. That's the gospel. Which means we are righteous before God and declared justified because of our faith in Christ. You see, Jesus did die for our sins, but he also lived for our righteousness. Because we need both. We need to have our sins washed away and we need to be perfect, have a perfect standing with God. We need to be perfect in His sight the way Adam was created to be initially. And we get all of this in Christ. Notice Paul says in verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many were made righteous. And I want you to again notice the contrast here because Adam, our federal head, by birth, disobeyed God. And because of that, we were made sinners. But because of Christ's obedience to God's perfect standard of righteousness, by faith in Him, we are made righteous. And the thing that we need to see here is this word that gets translated in English as made is actually from a Greek word that means to set into place or to, um, to give standing to. In other words, Because of Adam's disobedience, we have been given the standing of sinners. We have been appointed as sinners. Why? Because Adam, our covenant federal head, sinned on our behalf. But the good news is because of Christ's obedience, we are given the standing of righteousness. We are appointed as righteous. Not because we earned it, not because we did things to make God love us, but simply because we are declared righteous because of what Christ has done. Because we have faith in Christ, who is our new covenant head, our new representative. Now with all that, we can see the pieces are starting to come together. Adam sinned and disobeyed, and we were condemned as sinners, but Christ obeyed and earned a righteous standing, and by faith we are declared righteous and are justified, and because of that we are given eternal life. Brothers and sisters, that is the gospel. That is the good news. We are justified not by what we do, but by faith in Christ and what he has already done for us. 
To which the Jews then would naturally have asked, well, what about the law? And Paul has an answer for that. He says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. See, the tendency for the Jews was to see Moses as a federal head on par with Adam and Christ. They were familiar with this federal theology. They understood that, that Adam was their, their representative and that Jesus then ultimately would be their representative, but they, they saw Moses on the same plane. And though Moses, it is true that he represents the Mosaic Covenant, that covenant does not have the effect on all of mankind. And it's not of the permanent covenant that, that affects the entire world. Because the law was never given to make people righteous. That's the thing that we need to realize. That's the thing that Jews struggle with the most. The law was never given to make people righteous. The law was never given to, to make people right with God. In fact, the law was given, as Paul says, to reveal what sin is. Paul says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes what? Knowledge of sin. Or as he said in verse 3 in, in, of chapter 5, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. You see, Paul makes it clear the law was never intended to make a person righteous. It was given to reveal what sin is and then to drive us to see how helpless we are and then to finally push us to the place where we understand our need for a Savior, our need for someone to do for us the things that we couldn't do, someone who can make us righteous. And we... As we mentioned, Paul makes it clear that grace is so much greater than sin because he says, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then he says, so that sin reigned in death, great, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, Paul makes it clear that grace has the power to undo the power of sin and death. God's abundant grace cannot be thwarted God's grace cannot be held back by the tides of sin and death. God's grace cannot be resisted. And as Paul says here, grace reigns over sin and death, as we looked at before. But notice Paul says grace, the grace of God reigns through, what does it say? Through righteousness. And this righteousness leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, righteousness must come first. We must be made righteous. But praise the Lord that you don't have to try to earn righteousness by your own efforts. And this, is, this for me, is the plea for Christians, is to flee. Flee the bondage of legalism that just seems to plague our nation. That somehow, some way that we think, okay, Lord, I believe and I'm saved. Okay, give me the rules. Oh, I'm good today because I did this and I did. I'm not so good today because I didn't. That's not how it works. You're made righteous on the basis of what Christ has done for you, not what you can do for God. As again, as Harrison said, no sinner, whether a mystic aspiring, aspiring to direct contact with God or a legalist continuing, I mean, counting on good works for approval in God's sight is able to, in those ways, to find acceptance with God. Jesus must be the medium of the return of the sinner to a righteous God. That's the truth. We must have righteousness, but you'll never earn the righteousness on your own. You must have righteousness, but Christ offers you righteousness freely by putting your faith in Him and Him alone. So what do we do with this then? I mean, we've talked a lot in these 34 weeks, right? I mean, we've walked through what the gospel is. We've gazed at the glorious blessings that the gospel gives. We've explored how the gospel actually works and how it is that Adam by birth, how, how in Adam and by birth we sin and, and how we are in Christ by faith and how grace is greater than sin and death and how we reign in life and how the righteousness of Christ must come first. What do, we, what do we do with him with all this? Well, the first thing I would say is, if you're not in Christ, if you're not in Christ, that means you're still in Adam. And that means you're a sinner. 
under the condemnation and the judgment of God, and one day you will face the wrath of God. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because Christ, because of God's love, came into the world and died for your sins, but, most, but, but just as importantly, lived for your righteousness. And you today can be justified and have life if you would but repent and believe the gospel. That's what's required. It's not about you suddenly changing your life and then doing all you can do to get right with God. It's not about you stopping cussing today. It's not about you suddenly being able to, by your own efforts, become a better person. It's about hearing the promise that God will not leave you or forsake you if you put your faith in Christ. And doing just that, put your faith in Christ. And if you need help with that, I'd be happy to talk with anyone about that. So repent and believe the gospel. The second thing is if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, then rest in this truth. Rest in the truth that you have been historically justified by faith. And and you have been justified because you have been declared righteous and you've been declared righteous because Christ, as your federal head, did for you and earned for you a perfect righteous standing with God. And so that when you stand before God one day, you will be welcomed home as family and you possess all of the blessings of the gospel simply because you have taken God at His word. Jesus, by His grace, did all that's required. So when your hearts are filled with toil and worry, rest in Him. And then finally, I would say, we need to be bold in this. This truth, brothers and sisters, ought to make us unstoppable. It ought to make us want to get up and move to Slovakia and share the gospel with people we don't know, or at least right here in our own communities, right? It should cause us to want to share the hope of Christ with our community members, our family members, and our friends, knowing, right, that that we're not the ones that actually accomplish the work. What we do is sow the seed, love the people, and pray for God to change hearts, trusting that if we'll do that, then God will then do His part. Why? Because it's all God anyway. So we ought to be bold in this, knowing that God will complete what he started and that your efforts will not be in vain. Also knowing this is the truth that the world needs. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.